I'm James Banks, Membership Director from CIAT. I'm going to run through my PowerPoint presentation, give you a good idea of how you go about filling in your POP record and attain technician or chartered membership. POP record stands for Professional Occupational Performance. Um, in essence, it's a diary of your professional work experience. And you have to diarise your experience against the criteria within the document to allow CIAT to assess your skills. No one else by yourselves can complete your POP record and no one else by yourselves can progress your membership. We'll help you as much as we can from CIAT's perspective, but at the end of the day, it's your record, it's your diary, it's your membership. You have to take that step to move it forward. So first of all, we're going to start with routes of progression. Most of you should have a good idea of what route you're going to be following, depending on your experience and educational qualifications. But if I start on the blue side of the progression map, anyone with an honours degree uh, that's construction related, it doesn't necessarily have to be architectural technology. As long as you've got a construction related honours degree, as long as you're not offering services to clients, you can be an associate member, and most of you probably are associate members. That honours degree qualification means you can progress directly to become a chartered member via the technologist pot record and the professional practice interview process. Moving to the yellow section of the map, anyone with a higher national qualification, foundation degree, overseas equivalent, again, as long as you're not offering services directly to clients, you can be an associate member. If you've got more than 10 years experience in the industry, you should be following the same route as a graduate. You should be going directly for chartered membership via your technologist pot record in your interview, because we feel in that 10 years, you should have the necessary experience to become a chartered member of CIAT. For those with the higher national qualifications or equivalent and less than 10 years experience, you're gonna to have to follow the yellow arrow up the map and progress to technician membership via your technician pot record. But once you reach that technician level, you can go directly on to become a charter member as soon as you feel you've got the experience. So if you have the HNC, five years experience, become a technician member, you don't have to worry about that 10 year level now. You've got the technician grade, you can then move straight on to chartered membership via the technologist pot record process and the interview. Profile candidates in the room, you know, if you've got no formal qualifications, that doesn't mean you can't qualify with CIAT. You still need to fill in the technologist pot record and the professional practice interview if you've got more than 10 years experience less than 10 years experience, profiles are going to have to go to technician before they go on to chartered status. What I will highlight is, because you've got the honours degree, it doesn't mean you have to go for chartered membership. It just means you can bypass the technician graded membership. But if you've got a degree and you're actually working as an architectural technician and you don't feel you've got the skills to become a chartered member just yet, there's nothing stopping you progressing to technician membership via the technician pot record and then going for chartered membership at a later date when you feel you've got the experience required. It is flexible, as I said, it's your membership, it's your routes to progression. You decide, as long as you meet our set criteria, as to which qualifications you want to work towards. Chartered members of CIAT, uh, protected descriptor, chartered architectural technologist, designation MCIAT. As you can see by my graphic there, once you're a chartered member, you can run any architectural project from inception to completion. You can be the project leader of a design team, but that really depends on who you work for as to whether you're going to get the experiences to be the project lead and get opportunities to run jobs from start to finish. CIAT can't make your employers give you that experience. It's up to you to demonstrate to them that you are competent to perform that job role and give you the opportunities to gain that necessary experience. These 17 units are split across five key areas of skill. So you need to demonstrate a range of competence from start to finish. So project inception, one to three, project planning, four to six, design process, seven to 11, contract management 12 to 14, and professional practice 15 to 17. We will need to diarise your experience against all these units, but we will be assessing you across these five key areas of skills that we define for a chartered member of CIAT. Professionally qualified technicians, TCIAT qualification. In years gone by, people thought technicians and technologists were one or the same. Some professionals might still think technicians and technologists are one or the same. They're not. There's a clear difference. As you can see by my graphic there, Technician members are not project leaders. They work as part of the team, putting the puzzle together. So they work under direction of other qualified professionals. You can use the pot records as development documents. You know, 
if you haven't necessarily got all the experiences you need, you can clearly define to your employers, this is the career I'm working towards, this is my profession, these are the opportunities I need to attain, and this is how I need to develop myself. Can you arrange for me to get those opportunities? I'm sure a lot of you have annual appraisals where they say, you know, what are your future aims and objectives, what are your goals? And you should be relating your professional development, your pot record experience to say, this is what I need to develop into, these are the skills that I need. So, to get these qualifications, you work for, through the pot record. It's a diary of your professional work experience. Remember this, all of you have different work experiences. You all come from different backgrounds. You all work for different practices. You all work on different types of projects. That's fine by us. That means all of you can come and qualify with us. However, you're going to need to relate your specific experience to CIET's criteria as listed within the pot record. The good news is, it's flexible to suit you because there is no set time frame for completion. It is as quickly as you can address the competencies and get it verified by your supervisor. To give you an example, I met a member that backdated the whole document using his previous experience in a weekend. Granted, he went in, locked the office, took all the phones out and just sat down and referenced off all his experience, but he said he did it in two days. So some of you might think, right, I could do this if I had the time in a week. But you know, we, we all understand finding the time to sit down and diarise your experience is an issue for everybody. You know, there's never enough hours in a day. But assuming you're going to work towards this and you set yourself deadlines and timeframes, I can't see why, if you've run a job from start to finish, you can't fill in this pot record criteria quite quickly. Um, primarily, it could be because you can backdate this whole document using prior experience. As long as you've got the evidence to hand to demonstrate your competence in the process, in a way, all the actual hard work to meet the pot record criteria has been done already. It's stored on your hard drive or it's in the company filing systems. Obviously, for some of you who don't have the experiences, you need to speak to your supervisors or your line managers so that they can help you gain the necessary experiences that you don't have to become a qualified professional with CIAT. If you're going to backdate evidence, you need to make sure you can provide the documents you're referring to at a later date when CIAT asks for it. The second to last point as well is quite important for a lot of members. Case studies are acceptable for some units. So, to give an example, you may never get an opportunity to uh, administer a contract in your office. But there will be people in your office that do administer contracts. So, you can go to those individuals and say, can you set me a scenario or a case that I can work within? You can guide me through the processes of what I should and shouldn't be doing. And then you can use a case study to formulate the relevant documentary evidence to show I don't get to deal with it on a daily basis where I am at the moment, but if given this scenario, here is what I would produce. Here's the paperwork to show that I am competent in that area as and when the opportunities come to me. It's the same, you know, you might never get to meet the client at Project Inception when they're outlining exactly what they want from the practice. You know, they probably want the individual that owns that company to come and meet them. That's not to say you can't do a case study to say, this is Mr or Mrs X, this is what they want, and here's what I would produce for them at that stage of the project. This is an example from Unit 3. Each unit has underpinning knowledge. Underpinning knowledge is your theory of the process. How do you know what should be done at this stage of the project? To give you a comparison, I like to use uh, the modern style driving test. You have to pass your theory. I know how to drive. I know I should do this in this circumstance. I know I should do that in that circumstance. It's the same for CIAT's knowledge. Where did you get your theory and understanding of these processes from? And that is what knowledge is all about. Then you have performance evidence. Performance evidence is like sitting your practical driving test. It's all well and good knowing how to do something, but when the spotlight's on you, can you perform competently to meet the requirements of the project brief or whoever you're working for, of your client or fellow professionals? So performance is you producing the documents on projects to meet the relevant criteria. And all of you are going to answer these criteria differently based on your experiences and who you work for and what type of projects you undertake. We'll consider anything you can justify that you feel meet these criteria. What we will do, we will give you some indicators. They're known as the range indicators, which can be found in the supplementary guidance notes, which will outline the relevant options available for you to consider putting forward as documentary evidence to meet the unit criteria. To work through the pot record, you do need to appoint a supervisor, or for some of you, they'll also be a mentor. Now, they need to be a qualified professional themselves and in an ideal world, have a good understanding of your experience. Okay, because they're going to be vouching for what you're diarising and the documents you say you produce on various projects.
These are a list of the standard qualifications we accept. MCIET, ARB Registered Architect, RIBA member, MCIOB, MRICS, MICE. They're just the standard ones. There's a long list of other qualifications we accept. And the general rule is they're a qualified professional within the built environment. They can be your pot record supervisor. Hopefully all of you got a rough idea of who your supervisor might be. Generally, for those in practice, it'll be a line manager, a director, someone who has all the experiences to guide you through the process and can verify what you do on a daily basis. For those who are self-employed, more than likely you're going to have to ask one of your fellow construction professionals that you work with to vouch for your competency. Good news is you can have as many supervisors as you need. So, you know, if you've worked for different uh, practices and you've just moved jobs but you want other people to sign off different sections, by all means that's fine. Or if you're self-employed and you work with different professionals at different stages, they can sign it off for you as well. There is a list of CIA team members that will do it for you as well. But, you know, if you work with someone on a regular basis, they can verify what you're putting in because they know what you've worked on on certain projects and what your skills are. If you get a member from CIAT, you're going to have to show them every bit of paperwork to demonstrate each of the competencies as you're going to diarise it within your document. To clarify as well, supervisor guidance notes, downloadable from the CIAT website. Again, if they're not sure what their role is, you can always refer them to me. Hopefully all of you got a good idea of who this person might be for you. In regards to the knowledge or the theory, depending on your qualifications, you could actually be exempt from a large chunk of all the underpinning knowledge sections within the technician or the technologist pot record. If I start at the bottom, because it's nice and easy, if you have a CIAT accredited architectural technology honours degree, um, as long as you graduated after summer 2010, for the technician pot record knowledge one to nine, you're exempt, and for the technologist pot record one to 14 knowledge, you're exempt. If you graduated before summer 2010, then it's gonna be technician exemptions one, two, and four to nine, and for technologists, it's going to be 1, 2, 4, and 6 to 14 for the knowledge criteria that you're going to be exempt from. Going back a stage, completed HNC or HND. As long as it's construction related, you could be exempt from a large percentage of the knowledge base sections for technician or chartered membership. What I would recommend to you is as long as you've got your module breakdown, email us at CIAT. We'll get your membership file out. We'll map your HNC or your HND against our knowledge criteria and send you an email saying you're exempt from these following knowledge sections due to your qualification. Final one is the top one, an unrecognised or an unmapped qualification. So, BA Honours in Architecture, unmapped qualification. BSc Honours in Building Surveying, anything that's not accredited by CIAT is an unmapped qualification. That means CIAT don't know what you learn off that course. So we can't give you any knowledge exemptions for it. That's not to say that is not going to help you when you're addressing the theory criteria or the know-how. All you're going to do is relate what was studied in the specific module that you feel relates to CIAT's criteria and then explain how that's relevant to what we're asking for and then provide evidence of that qualification as sufficient evidence to demonstrate your knowledge of the processes required. It's the same for overseas qualifications. But you need to self-map and explain to us in your diary what you learnt and how it relates to what CIAT are asking for. This is your diary that you're going to fill in. This is called the Knowledge and Performance Portfolio. There's an editable Word version of this downloadable from the website. So in your diary, you're going to detail where you've got your knowledge or performance experience from. And if I give you an example, 15.1 is manage meetings. And the criteria will say, know how to manage meetings to achieve objectives. So in your diary, you might say, I've been on a CPD course or a training scheme where I was taught this is how I should manage a meeting and these are the various aspects that I need to make sure that I'm aware of before I go about having my meeting and performing it. It's a referencing process. You're explaining to us where you've learned that from. A lot of you probably picked it up through your career. It's called reflective practice. You've learned it off somebody else or you just picked it up through experience. That's fine. All you need to do in your diary is answer that know-how criteria and give us a brief explanation outlining what you learned and how that means you're going to be able to put that into practice. So for all of you, you think you know how it works, show us you can actually put that into practice. You know, when the pressure's on, when you're working to deadlines, your client's got certain expectations and requirements, can you perform competently to what the industry expects? Under the detail and location sheet, which is the blank A4 section where you diarise your experience, list the project or projects you're gonna use for the unit. You can use as many different projects across as many different units as you need to. The type and the size of the project's irrelevant to CIAT, 
you should be following the same professional process all the way through. So it's up to you to decide which projects you've got experience in which best prove your competency to what we're asking for. What I would like you to do is outline how you meet the unit criteria. And I'm going to explain how you go about filling in performance. 2.1, it says, in bold, assess survey requirements, data standards and outputs. So you've agreed your project parameter with your client. So you're now at the feasibility stage. When you're going out to do that survey, assess your survey requirements. What exactly do you need to find out from your feasibility study or from your surveys? What standards, what data standards are you going to be using to assess your survey against? And what are your outputs? What is your end result going to be? So explain. This is what I'm assessing my survey against, and here is what I've produced as documentary evidence to prove that. Under that is a bullet point. It says, you need to provide evidence to show that you've assessed the existing data and the project survey requirements. If you're not sure on what exactly you might provide to meet the criteria, you go back to the supplementary guidance notes. And again, it will have a range and scope list for unit two, where it will say survey type. So the type of survey you might provide as evidence will be a land or a building survey. What method of survey might you use? You might use a visual survey, you might use an approximate measured, you might use a detailed, you might use a graphical, or you might use an instrumental survey. Fine. All of you might have a different type of survey you're going to put forward, but it gives you ideas of what documents you can provide to show that you're competent to undertake the feasibility study. And it says, you know, investigation sources, what are you assessing it against? And in there it lists, you know, you might use photographs, maps, charts, drawings, people, archives. It's all probably what you do on a quite regular basis for any feasibility study that you're going to produce. And all you need to do is put your experience or your process you go through at that stage of the project in writing, and then make reference to documents that you feel meet the bullet point in the pot record. Remember, the bullet point evidence, your documentary evidence is what will pass your pot record. The words that you use to help explain your experience will not pass your pot record. That just helps us understand you and your experience when we come to assess it. What you have to submit is documentary evidence to show your competence in the relevant processes. Um, remember that if you work as part of a team, you can use evidence as part of a team, as long as you clearly demonstrate your role within that team and how it proves your competence in relation to the CIET criteria. Uh, also, you can work with fellow professionals. You could shadow a fellow professional in certain areas. You can jointly produce the documentation together, and that will allow you to explain your experience and demonstrate your competence in the relevant processes. It is all there within the CIET pot record competency document, and it is all there within the supplementary guidance notes. It's up to you to interpret that as you see fit based on your experience. Now, we can't assess your competence until you submit that whole signed off diary. But all you need to do initially in your workplace is get it verified by a qualified professional to say in their opinion, they feel you've met the competencies. Once it's all signed off, you can return that to CIAT. We can get the assessment process rolling. From there, you're asked for five units. Remember this, we never ask to see every unit. So we're going to take one unit from project inception, one unit from project planning, one unit from design process, and two units from contract management to be a chartered member. To become a technician member, we're going to take one unit from project inception, one unit from project planning, one unit from design process, one unit from contract management, and one unit for professional practice. And the theory is you've actually done all the work for that when I asked for them, because you should turn back to your e-portfolio or your, um, your knowledge and performance portfolio and it will tell you where all your evidence is kept that you need to submit to CIAT. Okay, so it's just a matter of pulling together the relevant documentation, sending it in for assessment. What I would recommend you do is if I'm asking for a unit where there's three bullet points, so 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, I recommend you have explanation of how you meet 2.1, all the relevant evidence behind it. Subdivider 2.2, all your relevant explanation of how you meet 2.2 and all your relevant documentary evidence behind that and 2.3, explanation, all the relevant evidence. Because these units are going to be given to chartered members, and they're going to be reading your documentation to assess your, your capabilities or your competence. You won't be there to explain. That's what your words are supposed to do. The words are supposed to outline to them your role within the process and how it proves your competence. So please make sure that your submission is in a logical and orderly format, and that someone else 
can understand the points you're trying to make. The CIA team members will be assessing against what is listed in the pot record competency document. They'll be reading how you do things and they'll be saying, right, has he provided records of X, records of Y, records of Z as listed within the pot record? If so, they can pass you. They'll say, lovely, we're happy with your five units, you've passed, you can move on to the next stage. That doesn't happen with every member. So what might happen, I'll say, right, unit one, four and eight, we're happy with. However, 12.1, 12.2 and 14.3, we've deferred you because there's insufficient examples of the following. And they will refer you back to what the criteria are asking for so you can review your submission and resubmit the additional bullet points that we've asked for. So that's your first deferral. So you can send 12.1, 12.2 and 14.3 in again in four weeks' time and hopefully you've addressed the deficiencies that we've highlighted. You've provided further examples or you've provided um, greater explanations so that they can understand the points we're trying to make. Hopefully after that, you pass, you move on to the next stage. What might happen is, and this does happen with members again, we say 12.1 and 12.2 are fine, you've passed that this time. But for 14.3, you seem to be missing the point of what we're asking for from you. That's classed as your second deferral. At that stage, I will try and put you in contact with someone that's assessed your evidence just to give you the necessary guidance to make sure on your third and final submission, you get it right. Okay? So on your third and final submission, uh, submission, you pay half the assessment fee again, which is £55, and fingers crossed you pass. Otherwise, you get referred. We'll tell you why you've been referred. You get referred for a set period of time, and you start the whole five-unit process again. The good news is I've been at CIAT nine years, and only two people have been referred. Most members get a deferral. You've just missed a couple of points, and then you can just go to town on those points. Also, if you feel we've missed something, you can appeal once against the pot panel's decision. You know, we'll hold our hands up. There might be times where we didn't quite understand the points you were trying to make or the evidence you provided. As long as you can justify the reason for your appeal, we will have a second look at it again for you. And you can get all the relevant information about uh, the pop record appeal process from the CIAT website or from me directly. For the technician qualification, you pass your five units, you pay your technician upgrade fee, you're a technician member. For chartered membership, once we pass your technologies pot record, we will say congratulations, you can now apply for your professional practice interview. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Hopefully this should give you a better idea of how you go about completing your pot record, how you go about qualifying with CIAT, and hopefully as you work through the document, if any queries arise, you can always come to us. You can ring us on the number on screen, or you can email us at any time, membership at ciat.org.uk, and we will give you the necessary guidance where possible. All I can do is encourage you to qualify, and good luck with it all.